13 at table by Lord Dunsany This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recording are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by om123 13 at table by Lord Dunsany In front of a spacious fireplace of the old kind when the logs were well alight and men with pipes and glasses were gathered before it in great easeful chairs and the wild weather outside and the comfort that was within and the season of the year for it was christmas and hour of the night all called for the weird and uncanny then out spoke the ex master of fox hounds and told this tale i once had an odd experience too it was when i had the bromley and sydenham the year i gave them up as a matter of fact it was the last day of the season it was no use going on because there were no foxes left in the country and london was sweeping down on us you could see it from the canals all along the skyline like a terrible army in gray and masses of villas every year came skirmishing down our valleys our coverts were mostly on the hills and as the town came clown upon the valleys the foxes used to leave them and go right away out of the country and they never returned i think they went by night and moved to great distances well it was early april and we had drawn blank all day and at the last draw of all the very last of the season we found a fox he left a covert with his back to london and its railways and villas and wire and slipped away towards the chalk country and the open kent i felt as i once felt as a child on one summer's day when i found a door in a garden where i played left lucky lazar and i pushed it open and the wild lands were before me and waving fields of corn we settled down into a steady gallop and the fields began to drift by under us and a great wind arose full of fresh breath we left the clay lands where the bracken grows and came to a valley at the edge of the chalk as we went down into it we saw the fox go up the other side like a shadow that crosses the evening ere it glided into a wood that stood on the top we saw a flash of primroses in the wood and we were out the other side hounds hunting perfectly and the fox still going absolutely straight it began to dawn on me then that we were in for a great hunt i took a deep breath when i thought of it the taste of the year of that perfect spring afternoon as it came to one galloping and the thought of a great run were together like some old rare wine our faces now were to another valley lower's fields led down to it with easy hedges at the bottom of it a bright blue stream went singing and a rambling village smoked the sunlight of the opposite slopes danced like a fairy and all along the top old woods were frowning but they dreamed of spring the fields had fallen off and were far behind and my only human companion was james my old forest whip who had a hound's instinct and a personal animosity against a fox that even embittered his speech across the valley the fox went as straight as a railway line and again we went without a check straight through the woods at the top i remember hearing men sing or shout as they walked home from work and sometimes children whistled the sounds came up from the village to the woods at the top of the valley after that we saw no more villages but valley after valley arose and fell before us as though we were voyaging some strange and stormy sea and all the way before us the fox went at that up wind like the fabulous flying dutchman there was no one inside now but my first whip and me we had both of us got on to our second horses as we drew the last covert two or three times we checked in those great lonely valleys beyond the village but i began to have inspirations i felt a strange certitude in me that this fox was going on straight up wind till he died or until night came and we could hunt no longer so I reversed ordinary methods and only cast straight ahead and always we picked up the scent again at once i believe that this fox was the last one left in the villa haunted lands 
and that he was prepared to leave them for remote uplands far from man, that if we had come the following day, he would not have been there, and that we just happened to hit off his journey. Evening began to descend upon the valleys. Still the hounds drifted on, like the lazy but unresting shadows of clouds upon a summer's day. We heard a shepherd calling to his dog. We saw two maidens move toward a hidden farm, one of them singing softly. No other sounds, but ours disturbed a laser in the loneliness of the haunts that seemed not yet to have known the inventions of steam and gunpowder. And now the day and our horses were wearing out. But that resolute fox held on. I began to work out the run and to wonder where we were. The last landmark I had ever seen before must have been five miles back, and from there to the start was at least ten miles more. If only we could kill, then the sun said. I wondered what chance we had of killing our fox. I looked at James's face as he rode beside me. He didn't seem to have lost any confidence, yet his horse was as tired as mine. It was a good clear twilight and the scent was as strong as ever, and the fences were easy enough. But those valleys were terribly trying, and the steel rolled on and on. It looked as if the light would outlast all possible endurance, both of the fox and the horses. If the scent held good, and he did not go to ground, otherwise night would end it. For long we had seen no houses and no roads only chalk slopes with twilight on them, and here and there some sheep and scattered corpses darkening in the evening. At some moment I seemed to realize all at once that the light was spent and that darkness was hovering. I looked at James. He was solemnly shaking his head. Suddenly, in a little looted valley, we saw climb over the oaks the red brown gables of a queer old house. At that instant I shot a fox, scarcely leading by fifty yards. We blundered tree wood into full sight of the house, but no avenue led up to it, or even a path, nor were there any signs of wheel marks anywhere. Already light shone here and there in windows. We were in a park, and a fine park, but unkempt beyond credibility. Brambles grew everywhere. It was too dark to see the fox any more. But we knew he was dead bit. The hounds were just before us, and a four foot railing of oak. I shouldn't have tried it on a fresh horse at the beginning of a run, and here was a horse near his last gasp. But what a run! And even standing out in a lifetime, and the hounds close upon their fox, slipping into the darkness as I hesitated. I decided to try it. My horse rose about eight inches and took it fair with his breast and the oak long flew into handfuls of wet decay. It was rotten with ears, and then we were on a lawn, and at the far end of it the hounds were tumbling over their fox. Fox, horses, and light were all done together at the end of a twenty-mile point. We made some noise then, but nobody came out of the queer old house. I felt pretty stiff as I walked round to the hall door with the mask and the brush, while James went with the hounds and the two horses to look for the stables. I rang a bell marvelously and crossed it with trust. And after a long while the door opened a little way, revealing a hall with much old armor in it and the shabbiest butler that I have ever known. I asked him who lived there. Sir Richard Allen. I explained that my horse could no further at night and that I wished to ask Sir Richard Allen for a bit. Oh, no one ever comes here, sir, said the butler. I pointed out that I had come. I don't think it would be possible, sir, he said. This annoyed me, and I asked to see Sir Richard, and insisted until he came. Then I apologized and explained the situation. He looked only fifty, but a varsity or on the wall with the date of the early seventies made him older than that. His face had something of the shy look of the hermit. He regretted that he had no room to put me up. I was sure that this was untrue. Also I had to be put up there. There was nowhere else within miles, so I almost insisted. 
Then, to my astonishment, he returned to the butler, and they talked it over in an undertone. At last, they seemed to think that they could manage it, though clearly with reluctance. It was by now seven o'clock, and Sir Richard told me he dined at half past seven. There was no question of clothes for me other than those I stood in, as my host was shorter and broader. He showed me presently to the drawing room, and then he reappeared before half past seven in evening dress and a white waistcoat. The drawing room was large and contained old furniture, but it was rather worn than venerable. An Avalon carpet flapped about the floor. The wind seemed momentarily to enter the room, and old draught scented corners. Still, the feet of rats that were never at rest indicated the extent of the ruin that time had wrought in the wainscot. Somewhere far off, a shutter flapped to and fro. The guttering candles were insufficient to light so large a room. The gloom that these things suggested was quite in keeping with Sir Richard's first remark to me after he entered the room. I must tell you, sir, that I have led a wicked life. Oh, a very wicked life. Such confidences from a man much older than oneself, after one has known him for half an hour, are so rare that any possible answer merely does not suggest itself. I said rather slowly, "Oh, really?" And chiefly to forestall another such remark, I said, "What a charming house you have!" Yes, he said, "I have not left it for nearly forty years since I left the university. One is young there, you know." And one has opportunities, but I make no excuses, no excuses. And the door, slipping its rusty latch, came drifting on the draught into the room, and a long carpet flapped and hanging up on the walls. Then the draught fell rustling away, and the door slammed to again. Oh, Marianne, he said, we have a guest tonight, Mister Linton. This is Marianne Gibb, and everything became clear to me. Mad, I said to myself, for no one had entered the room. The rats ran up the length of the room behind the wainscot ceaselessly, and the wind unlatched the door again, and folds of the carpet fluttered up to our feet and stopped there. For our weight held it down. Let me introduce Mr. Linton," said my host, Lady Mary Arinza. The door slammed back again. I bowed politely. Even had I been invited, I should have humoured him, but it was the very least that an uninvited guest could do. This kind of thing happened eleven times: the rustling, the fluttering of the carpet, the footsteps of the rats, the restless door, and then the sad voice of my host introducing me to phantoms. Then, for some while, we waited while I struggled with the situation. Conversation flowed slowly, and again the draught came trailing up the room. While the flaring candles filled in with hurrying shadows, ah, let again, Cecily," said my host in his soft, mournful way. "Always late, Cecily." Then I went down to dinner with that man, and his mind and the twelve phantoms that haunted it. I found a long table with fine old silver on it, and places laid for fourteen. The butler was now in evening dress. There were fewer draughts in the dining room. The scene was less gloomy there. Will you sit next to Rosalind at other end? Sir Richard said to me. She always takes the head of the table. I wronged her most of all. I said. I said with a lie. I looked at the butler closely, but never did I see by an expression of his face, or by anything that he did. And a suggestion that he waited upon less than fourteen people in the complete possession of all their faculties. Perhaps a dish appeared to be refused more often than taken, but every glass was equally filled with champagne. At first, I found little to say, but when Sir Richard, speaking from the far end of the table, said, "You were tired, Mr. Linton," I was reminded that I owed something to a host upon whom I had forced myself. It was excellent champagne. I need the help of a second glass. I made the effort to begin a conversation with Miss Helen Arold, for whom the place upon one side of me was laid. It came more easy to me very soon. 
I frequently paused in my monologue, like Mark Antony, for a reply, for sometimes I turned and spoke to Miss Rosalind Smith. Sir Richard had uttered and talked sorrowfully on. He spoke as a condemned man might speak to his judge, and yet somewhat as a judge might speak to one that he once condemned wrongly. My own mind began to turn to mournful things. I drank another glass of champagne, but I was still thirsty. I felt as if all the moisture in my body had been blown away over the dawns of Kent by the wind up which we had galloped. Still I was not talking enough. My host was looking at me. I made another effort. After all, I had something to talk about. A twenty-mile point is not often seen in a lifetime, especially south of the Thames. I began to describe the run to Rosalind Smith. I could see then that my host was pleased. The sad look in his face gave a kind of a flicker. Like mist upon the mountains on a miserable day when a faint puff comes from the sea and the mist to lift if it could. And the butler refilled my glass very attentively. I asked her first if she hunted and paused and began my story. I told her where we found a fox and how fast and straight he had gone and how I had got through the village by keeping to the road while the little gardens and where, and the river had stopped the rest of the field. I told her the kind of country that we crossed and how splendid it looked in the spring, and how mysterious the valleys were as soon as the twilight came, and what a glorious horse I had and how wonderfully he went. I was so fearfully thirsty after the great hunt that I had to stop for a moment now and then but I went on at my description of that famous run, for I had warmed to the subject, and after all there was nobody to tell of it but me except my old whipper in, and the old fellows probably drunk by now, I thought. I described to her minutely the exact spot in the run at which it had come to me clearly that this was going to be the greatest hunt in the whole history of Kant. Sometimes I forgot incidents that had happened, as one well may in a run of twenty miles, and then I had to fill in the gaps by inventing. I was pleased to be able to make the party go off well by means of my conversation. And besides that, the lady to whom I was speaking was extremely pretty. I do not mean in a flesh and blood kind of way, but there were little shadowy lines about a chair beside me that hinted at an unusually graceful figure when Miss Rosalind Smith was alive. And I began to perceive that, what I first mistook for the smoke of guttering candles and a tablecloth waving in a draught was in reality an extremely animated company who listened, and not without interest, to my story of by far the greatest hunt that the world had ever known. Indeed, I told them that I would confidently go farther and predict that never in the history of the world would there be such a run again. Only my throat was terribly dry. And then, as it seemed, they wanted to hear more about my horse. I had forgotten that I had come there on a horse. But when they reminded me, it all came back. They looked so charming leaning over the table, intent upon what I said, that I told them everything they wanted to know. Everything was going so pleasantly, if only Sir Richard would cheer up. I heard his mournful voice every now and then. These are very pleasant people, if only he would take the right way. I could understand that he regretted his past. But the early seventies seemed centuries away, and I felt now that he misunderstood these ladies. They were not revengeful, as he seemed to suppose. I wanted to show him how cheerful they really were. And so I made a joke, and they all laughed at it. And then I shoved them a bit, especially Rosalind and nobody resented it, in the very least. And still, Sir Richard said, dear, with that unhappy look, like one that has ended weeping because it is vain, and has not the consolation even of tears. We had been a long time here, and many of the candles had burnt out, but there was a light enough. I was glad to have audience for my exploit, and being happy myself, I was determined Sir Richard should be. I made more jokes and I still laughed good-naturedly. Some of the jokes were a little broad perhaps, but no harm was meant. And then, I do not wish to excuse myself, but I had had a harder day then 
I ever had had before, and without knowing it, I must have been complexly adjusted. In this state the champagne had found me, and what would have been harmless at any other time must somehow have got the better of me when quite tired out. Anyhow, I went too far. I made some joke. I cannot in the least remember what that suddenly seemed to offend them. I felt all at once a commotion in the air. I looked up and saw that they had all risen from the table and were sweeping towards the floor. I had no time to open it, but it blew open on a wind. I could scarcely see what Sir Richard was doing because only two candles were left. I think the rest blew out when the lady suddenly rose. I sprang up to apologize, to assure them, and then fatigue overcame me, as it had overcome my horse at the last fence. I clutched at the table, but the cloth came away, and then I fell. The fall and the darkness on the floor, and the pent of fatigue of the day overcame me all three together. The sun shone over glittering fields, and in at a bedroom window, and thousands of birds were chanting to the spring. And there I was, in an old four-poster bed, in a quaint old panel bedroom, fully dressed and wearing long muddy boots. Someone had taken my spurs, and that was all. For a moment I failed to realize, and then it all came back. My enormity and depressing need of an abject apology to Sir Richard. I pulled an embroidered bell rope until the butler came. He came in perfectly cheerful and indescribably shabby. I asked him if Sir Richard was up, and he said he had just gone down, and told me to my amazement that it was twelve o'clock. I asked to be shown in to Sir Richard at once. He was in his smoking room. Good morning, he said cheerfully the moment I went in. I went directly to the matter in hand. I fear that I insulted some ladies in your house, I began. You did indeed, he said, you did indeed, and then he burst into tears, and took me by the hand. How can I ever thank you, he said to me then. We have been turning a table for thirty years, and I never dared to insult them, because I had wronged them all, and now you have done it, and I know they will never dine here again. And for a long time he still held my hand, and then he gave it a grip and a kind of shake which I took to mean goodbye and I drew my hand away then and left the house. And I found James in the Jews' tables with the hounds and asked him how he had fared. And James, who is a man of very few words, said he could not rightly remember. And I got my spurs from the butler and climbed on to my horse. And slowly we rode away from that queer old house, and slowly we went at home. For the hounds were footsore but happy and the horses were tired still. And when we recalled that the hunting season was ended, we turned our faces to spring, and thought of the new things that tried to replace the old. And that very year I heard, and had often heard since, of dances and happy dinners at Sir Richard Arlene's house. Thirteen at Table by Lord Dunsany. <laughs>